All right, welcome to the final lecture on entanglement theory. This is a tutorial lecture series for She Quantum, which is an organization dedicated to supporting women in research and learning of quantum information science. Okay, in the last few lectures, we started getting into uh, the resource theory of entanglement, the operational tasks of entanglement distillation, entanglement dilution. We talked about concrete examples of entanglement measures, such as entropy of entanglement for pure states, entanglement of formation for general mixed states. We talked about logarithmic negativity. We talked about relative entropy of entanglement. We talked about range relative entropy. We talked about relations between them. Uh, I gave you a MATLAB program that can compute the range relative entropy. And in this final lecture, we'll talk about squash entanglement, okay? So this picture is helpful for thinking about squash entanglement. Um, and it's, it's kind of like a cryptographic, uh, a, a picture that you think about in the context of cryptography. We have two protagonists, Alice and Bob, who are trying to get a secret key that's unknown to the antagonist Eve in the middle, okay? Um, so this kind of thinking is helpful when thinking about squash entanglement. Okay, so let's start with some basic starting point. A measure of correlations for a bipartite quantum state is the mutual information, okay? So mutual information classically goes back to Claude Shannon in 1948. Um, in the quantum case, it can be traced to someone named Stratonovich in 1965. And this is the formula. You take the state, you plug it in as the first argument of the quantum relative entropy. As the second argument, you plug in the tensor product of the marginal state. So you take row AB, take the partial trace over B, you get row A, take the partial trace over A, you get row B, take the tensor product, put it in here. So why is this an interesting measure? It's a measure of correlations, right? So if rho AB is a product state, then it's equal to rho A tensor rho B and the quantum relative entropy will be zero. However, if it's not a product state, the quantum relative entropy will be strictly greater than zero. And so then it's kind of telling you the deviation from a product state. Okay, so, so if, if rho AB is, is very far from a product state, um, you know, the, the maximum the mutual information can be is um, twice the minimum of the log of the local dimensions of A and B. So that's the largest you can be. And that's saturated by a maximally entangled state. Okay, so there's a, an equivalent expression for mutual information where you can take the relative entropy over all possible product states, not just you know, the tensor product of the local marginal states. You can take the, the, you can optimize over all possible product states. And that is also equal to the mutual information. That's from a peculiar property of relative entropy that you derive this. Okay. This on its own is not a useful measure of entanglement because it's measuring all correlations, including the classical ones. So like you could plug in a separable state and the, the quantum mutual information could be non-zero, right? And so it's not particularly on its own useful as an entanglement measure. However, we can modify things. And to see this, let's consider a separable state. So, <clears throat> Suppose that rho AB is separable, then you can write it as a convex combination of product states. That we've talked about a lot throughout the lectures. And you can find an extension of this state that has this form. So you just create this extension system X and you put these classical labels here where this ket X is part of an orthonormal basis. 
So why is an extension, if you trace over system X, you get back to the original state, okay? But what you notice is condition on the value X in the classical system, the state of A and B is product, right? So if you know the value of X, then this, the state of A and B is a product state. And so then it will be equal to zero, okay? And that happens for a separable state. So what it suggests is um, we, we can make use of this in defining an entanglement measure. Okay, so to do so, let's consider the, what's called conditional mutual information. Previously, we talked about mutual information, now we have conditional mutual information. So we take a tripartite state on systems A, B, and E, and then we compute this linear combination of entropies. And remember that the entropy formula is of a state rho is minus trace rho log base two rho, okay? So you do that for each of these. Here you would use the reduced state on systems A and E tracing over B, the reduced state on systems B and E tracing over A, et cetera. Okay, so one thing we know about this conditional mutual information is that it's always non-negative. That's a highly non-trivial theorem called strong subadditivity. Uh, it has an interesting proof. And if you wanna look at proofs, you can look at the book I have with Sumit, uh, Principles of Quantum Communication Theory and Modern Approach. Okay, so as it turns out, conditional mutual information, if you make the conditioning system X, in this general definition, we called it E, if you make the conditioning system X classical, then the conditional mutual information will just be a convex combination of mutual information. Okay. And using that, we can define what's what we then call squash entanglement with a classical extension. Okay. So squash entanglement with a classical extension is you minimize the value of the conditional mutual information subject to the constraint that there exists this extension state such that system X is classical. And when you trace over X, you get back the state of interest. So that is an interesting entanglement measure, but that's not gonna be what we use. We wanna just use a fully quantum case. Okay, but it's interesting because it is gonna be zero for every separable state. And the way it's zero is exactly this procedure that we showed over here. You just pick the extension system to contain the hidden variable of the separable state. In this case, the hidden variable is X. Okay. And you can also prove that it's a selective LOCC monotone. So finally, let's define the squash entanglement. And it's really just that you use the conditional mutual information. You, you take an infimum over all possible extension systems such that when you trace over E, then you get back the state row AB of interest. Okay. So why is it called squash entanglement? You look at this quantity and you wonder, well, gee, why do we call this squash entanglement? You should think of conditional mutual information as measuring the correlations between Alice and Bob from the perspective of the eavesdropper Eve. And what we're doing is we're thinking of all possible extension systems that Eve could possess to make the conditional mutual information as small as possible. Okay, so that's the, that's the understanding we have. And then squash because Eve is trying to squash down the quantum correlations that Alice and Bob possess as measured by this conditional mutual information. Okay. For mathematical reasons that may not be of interest to everyone, but it's, it's an important issue is that it's not clear that we can replace this infimum with a minimum. Many times you can do that in applications, but here it seems to be necessary because no one knows how to place an upper bound on the dimension of this eavesdropper system and the optimization. So, um, you know, 
this this quantity on its own is likely uh, difficult to compute. It has been proven NP hard to compute, but it might even be like uncomputable. But that's not really a problem because the main use of squash entanglement is as an as a bound on distillable entanglement or as a bound on distillable secret key in quantum cryptography. And so as long as you can pick a clever extension state, then you can get a good bound. In some cases, you can prove it's optimal. What are the properties of squash entanglement? Like the other entanglement measures, it reduces to the entanglement entropy for pure states. It is a selective LOCC monotone. So it's not only an entanglement measure, but has this stronger property. It's convex, it's additive, it's faithful. And then the, the very useful thing is that it's an upper bound on distillable entanglement, and it's also a lower bound on entanglement cost. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of entanglement measures. Let's think about an example, okay? This is a physical example of interest. Um, I think even for applications in quantum computing, right? So this, this generalized amplitude damping channel is a noise process and you can think of it in terms of this diagram where like your qubit is interacting um, by means of like a beam splitter coupling with a thermal environment state. And then this, this is what Bob gets, the output of the channel, and this is what the environment gets. And this is a pretty good model of relaxation and thermal noise that can occur in a superconducting quantum computer, like the ones being built by IBM and Rigetti, et cetera. So it's, it's an interesting and phenomenologically motivated noise model. This is the mathematical description. There are two parameters, gamma. Gamma describes um, the relaxation or damping, and N describes the strength of thermal noise in the environment. Okay, and these are the Krauss operators. It's a quantum channel, so it has Krauss operators. And this is a plot of distillable entanglement of states that you can realize using this channel, okay? So we don't know what the exact value of the distillable entanglement is. We just know that it lies in the shaded region of each plot. So here we're changing with each plot, the thermal noise in the background. We're sort of increasing the strength of the noise, right? And then along this, we're showing um, the damping parameter, right? So as it gets larger, there's more relaxation, the channel's noisier. And then the, the, the vertical axis is the, distill, the rate at which you can distill bell states from the state made by the channel, okay? So we didn't talk about lower bounds, but there's something called coherent information, which gives you a lower bound on how much entanglement you can distill. So that's shown in each plot. And then these are upper bounds um, constructed from squash entanglement. That's the blue and the magenta in each plot. So you see squash entanglement is a good bound for low levels of thermal noise in the background, but then the range bound ends up doing better as the noise is increased. And it's, we call it range like bound because we need to do a little trick to bring in the range bound precisely. Um, okay, as another example, let's consider what's called dephased bell state. So you have a, you know, qubit, qubit bell state. And then with some probability, nothing happens. With the complementary probability, you apply sigma Z operator, which is the phase operator. And it's like phase noise acting on the state. And so what we're showing is uh, the distillable entanglement and the entanglement cost as you increase the dephasing parameter. Turns out that this channel has a certain symmetry about Q equals one half when the dephasing parameter is equal to one half, because it's kind of like 
just flipping the situation around. Um, but what we find is that, you know, what you would expect is that if there's no dephasing of Q equals zero, then the state is just equal to an EBIT. And so you get one EBIT per copy of the state kind of like automatically. And so the distillable entanglement will be equal to the entanglement cost. Then as you increase the dephasing parameter, the, distill, the distillable entanglement goes down. It's going down pretty sharply. And uh, the entanglement cost is, is going down as well because it's easier to prepare a noisier state, okay? And then eventually when Q equals half, you can prove that the state becomes a separable state. And so, you know, both the distillable entanglement and the entanglement cost are equal to zero for separable states. And then it goes back up. Okay, so I think we're getting to like the summary of everything. We talked about a lot of different entanglement measures. We talked about tasks of entanglement distillation, entanglement dilution, and the corresponding quantities, distillable entanglement and entanglement cost. This gives you a sense of like an ordering, right? So we know that entanglement formation is an upper bound on entanglement cost. We know it's an upper bound on relative entropy of entanglement. Um, we know that squash entanglement is between entanglement cost and distillable entanglement. And then we know that Rain's relative entropy is smaller than the relative entropy of entanglement and it's an upper bound on distillable entanglement. For some states, the Rain's relative entropy is better and for other states, the squash entanglement is a better bound on distillable entanglement. So, at the moment, we need both unless someone figures out a clever way of combining them. I don't know if anyone has attempted that. Okay, so we're at the end. We talked about a lot of stuff in this lecture series. Um, you know, one of which is how entanglement is a resource for tasks like teleportation, dense coding, and QKD. In entanglement theory, what we're trying to do is we're trying to quantify entanglement um, to say, how much entanglement does a quantum state have? To answer that question, we cooked up operational tasks like entanglement distillation and dilution, which connect to something of physical interest. And uh, then, then we've, we talked about all these different entanglement measures like entanglement formation, squash entanglement, Rain's relative entropy, and how they're bounds on these operational tasks. Um, you know, if you're interested in research on this topic, there's still other questions to consider. Um, one kind of broad question would be, are there other interesting and useful entanglement measures? With my colleague, Shin Wang, uh, who's now working for the company Baidu in China, we did exactly this. We came up with an entanglement measure that has a operational meaning and it's efficiently computable. And so that solves some questions in entanglement theory that have been open for two decades. Um, another interesting question would be to find more examples of states for which we can calculate squash entanglement. So far, there's really only a few that are known. Um, this is a question we raised before. Can you actually compute in general the squash entanglement? Is there an example of a state for which you simply cannot compute the squash entanglement. And more broadly, what is the relevance of these entanglement measures in other areas of physics? So these entanglement measures have been used in thermodynamics and condensed matter theory, and even now in, in trying to understand quantum gravity. So, um, you know, a lot of people from these different fields are studying entanglement theory and uh, they're also inventing new entanglement measures. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thanks for listening. At the end of the slides, you can find uh, all these references that I made throughout the talk and uh, the slides will be made available online. Uh, online. Thank you.